Um, I am Tato Chief Emmanuel Chukuma Abugu. Actually, I hail from Enugu Ezike. Okay. It was a North local government, okay. Enugu state of Nigeria. So many things have actually changed. Even my age has changed from about 23 years, young Emmanuel to advanced Emmanuel, from Emmanuel to Dato Emmanuel. So in terms of uh, politics, Malaysia has changed hand in politics from Dr. Mahadi era to Badawi era to Najib and then back to uh, Dr. Mahathi. So infrastructurally also Malaysia has changed very uh, tremendously. Um, the time I came I am very much sure that there was no IOI in Puchong. Today uh, this uh, Puchong is a, a metropolitan city and also you talk about the highest wind tower that they have now those days it wasn't there. They only had uh, what we call a telecom tower. So economically, the graph is going up and down. When we came, we were very few. I think I landed in Breakfield and I met about um, quite few number of them. We were about six at that time before we shifted to Chalky and the population started growing progressively. I came to Malaysia with sole and primary objective to further my education. So from there, you know, life changes and um, before I finished my studies in Stanford College, uh, I got my admission in Stanford College in the year 1996. So when I finished from there, I started my own business. So I was here primarily for education. Yeah. This perception of Malaysians on Africa progressively has changed towards positive. Because during that time, uh, I think many Malaysians have not seen black Africans. And uh, they have the impression that uh, they don't get close to us, maybe because they have uh, the spirit of fear of what we call a uh, xenophobism. So even many of them close their nose at every proximity with Africa. They even sit away from us in the buses. But today it has changed. We can mix up freely. I've gone and I've done so many business uh, ranging from hawking. Um, during that time, it was a combination of uh, my studies with a part-time called part-time hockey. In uh, every African understanding, we call it Sampa. It is just about selling watches and wallets. So we were hawking it from every street of Malaysia. Practically, I know most of the streets in Malaysia. I think I've traveled to so many uh, states with the exception of Sabah and Sarawak. So after that um, I found myself doing restaurant. Okay, and the restaurant name was a uh, Aheng restaurant. It was done under it was done in Chinese concept. Yeah, so eventually I saw myself being Chinese boss. I was the boss of the Chinese. The name Majestic uh, is inspirational. He came to me that in everything one does, uh, he must have a target. He or she must have uh, a target. So, and uh, ambitiously, that target has to be Majestic. So that's how the name came, and I, I should uh, make it a permanent name by incorporating a name in that majestic target. Shipping and logistic uh, business in Malaysia is uh, actually movement of goods from one uh, port to another, I mean from one area to another destination. 
In fact, it was it is quite challenging because uh, unlike those days when I was the only person or uh, the only uh, uh, businessman dealing on shipping, today we have so many competitors. So that makes the cake, the share of the cake to become smaller. So uh, eventually and notably also it is worthy to note here that I was the first African to establish a business that is in shipping and logistics as far as Malaysia is concerned. Then um, in the situation of losing uh, uh, goods in the vessel, yes, that reminds me of the year 2013. I had a cargo on the vessel in PIL, so en route, en route to Angola. So along the line, the vessel caught fire, and the front part of the the front part of the vessel caught fire. And uh, it happens to be that my container was one of the one of the goods that was affected. So in that situation, that also led me to learn so many things, get so many informations and knowledge about all these marine policies, laws and otherwise we come to know about marine insurance, uh, marine or just law and so on and so forth. It's a very painful experience. We lost everything. Uh, we do export many products from uh, Malaysia to African continent, auto parts to new Malaysian made products like uh, this type of beverages. This is Magnona uh, malt drink. So it has gotten NAFDAQ number in Nigeria. And it is one of our products. Yeah, and uh, based on what we do, uh, as to why we choose this kind of products, it is based on our past experience and the future prospects that the goods has. The only way to go with the authority is to abide by the laws. Malaysia has a standard and constitutional policies, so it doesn't matter whether you are foreigner or local, you have to abide by it to establish and operate business in this host country. So um, I choose to be a conformist and a formalist by abiding by the law, try my best not to go contrary. So to establish business in Malaysia, you just have to be, um, you just have to uh, be, have a valid traveling document and uh, at the same time have to register what we call private limited company. In their language, they call it Sindram Rahat. You can register enterprise as a foreigner. And uh, at the same time, you have uh, to have a local partner that has a larger share, uh, a larger share, percentage share of the share capital, which ranges from 51% and so forth. I very much support that we should invest in this country uh, because Malaysia is one of the countries in South Asia that allows Africans to come in and they give us some enabling ground. If you talk, if you say that Malaysia is not, uh, I mean, is not giving us a long stay, there are instances where a Nigerian has become a citizen of this country. I'm talking about a footballer in northern part of uh, Malaysia. And also many of us here as Africans, we have our red IC, which is a road to becoming citizens, which I know it will come. The only thing is we also am advising that we should not put all our eggs in one basket. While we are investing here, we should also think about home. Yes, I will consider Malaysia a friendly country towards Africans. Uh, because 
naturally Malaysia is a diverse uh, society in itself. Uh, by this I mean they are heterogeneous in race. They have different races uh, made up of Malays, Chinese and Indians. So, so with this with this fact, rather than the phobia and the xenophobia in them, and some of them shy away because uh, maybe they cannot communicate and all this. Uh, and the reasons of it, uh, they, they they have love for Africans, but Africans also in their own side must be law-abiding and uh, respect the culture of the country, the host country. With this, I think they will be more friendly with us. Dato is an important person in the in Malay society. It is a title given by the kings. So that means you are prominent, you are respectable, and you can get that worship through your behavior, your being responsible, your law abiding, and your contribution towards the economic of the country. And um, particularly to myself, I obtained that worship uh, by recommendation, through recommendation of locals, uh, stating that I've been here for so long. Uh, without uh, having, having records of criminality and uh, being helpful to the host, to the host. Um, actually, my datoship uh, came from Malacca. So that reminds me of one Indian comedian uh, by the name Sharukan. He got his own uh, datoship also from Malacca. So, um, it was then I knew that foreigners also can receive authorship. Uh, it wasn't challenges actually. The challenges only I can see from the terms of behaving yourself, being responsible and uh, being a good uh, uh, ambassador of your country. Then uh, the challenges is really now because I can't really do anyhow, you know. So I have to respect myself and respect the title. There are things I was doing those days, but I find it difficult uh, to do it now, you know. So uh, that's, that's it. The responsibilities that uh, comes with the title is to uphold the prestige and also be law-abiding and uh, uh, maintain your good behavior just like I mentioned earlier that there are things I do those days that I cannot afford to do it now because I need to respect the title. People respect you. I go out even most of the time I don't I don't like to mention and tell people I'm Datu, but many have known, even in police station, when I go there, they call me Datu, Datu in some, uh, some areas that I do business, even the locals, they address me as Datu, I mean, it gives joy, I mean, I feel elated most of the time. Hundred percent, they're not, uh, they're not wrong. Maybe it's part of it because being here, being here for so long, is because I'm married and I have kids. But at the same time, also, uh, it's because of the comportment, the being law-abiding and the hardworking and other things. So other factors are, so, are also involved. Uh, I don't agree with that uh, notion that uh, anybody is res restricted from marrying anybody. It doesn't matter if government or individual. What, uh, what plays a part is love. And maybe the uh, concession, the consent from the both parents and every other thing follows. Uh, my family, my family
family back home when I told them about my intention of getting married. Of course, naturally, every person wants you to marry uh, his or her own kind. So they gave uh, some objection, but uh, with my persistence, they were convinced. Yeah, that is really where I face challenges. You know, as a black man, as an African, they said no, um, you cannot, and all this, and all that. Even they told my wife, how can you be going to Africa, marrying um, a black man, and so on. So it just, like what I've said before, that what plays a part is love. And uh, with the process of time, one will be able to convince the parents, and that's all. So after that, they were convinced. Uh, the mother was convinced, and uh, as a woman, you know, once the mother is convinced, the father has no say. <laughs> so then uh, I will take you, let me give you a, just a gist. So after that, when they agreed, we had to go to Sarawak because my wife is from Sarawak. We had to go to Sarawak. I went alone. I'm the only man who married my wife alone. So I went alone because due to passport, traveling document issue, nobody, my people was, my people were not in position to go with me. One of my cousin brothers here in Malaysia, he was here then, his name is Lawrence. He called me, he said, you don't go there, you know, because they say these people is a potong kepala. The, the head uh, headhunters and really my wife comes from uh, that particular race called the ban in the olden days the headhunters he said I heard about this you don't dare to go there you don't go there I, if anything happens to you uh, I don't know I wouldn't know I, I did you know because love is already there so love is a very strong factor I went there the marriage there is a bit uh, different you know so the whole villagers had to gather together and I was like center of attraction some people came to see an African whom they have not seen before so and many of them were not speaking English so they had a teachers there who was when I speak they interpret so they asked me so many questions which in me, I felt that I answered correctly. So that's how our marriage was blessed. Uh, the raising of our kids as mixed children in the Malaysian as a country is the same experience that uh, others before us have witnessed. To be honest, it's real hell. It's really painful seeing your daughter coming back to cry and say she's been discriminated against you know there was a time that uh, i think three of my children came came back from the playing ground telling me that they were asked to go back to their own country that they don't belong here i got infuriated i went there they all ran away then um, another incident is where my daughter said I don't like this my hair. It's killy, killy hair and it's not straight like others. I told her, no, you are the most beautiful girl, you know. Killy hair is something very, very nice, very beautiful, you know. And we continue to advise them. But thank God today they, they really like it because they are grown ups, they know the truth. Other than Dato Emmanuel, my name is also Majestic Target. As my name indicates, I always have target. Just like I said, in anything you do, you must have a target. So when you have a target, you have sense of direction. You move towards the direction and you must be disciplined, you must be committed, you must be determined. And um, at the same time, of course, you must be prayerful. My advice to my fellow Africans in Malaysia or wherever they are, even in Nigeria or in our own 
continent or Europe is that success is a process. It is a gradual process, it doesn't come overnight. And uh, choosing to be in a fast lane is precarious and dangerous. So to some of them, I always tell them, you don't have to go that way. You don't have to go left even when right is not an option. You just have to maintain keeping to your right. Because if you break the cola nut, uh, the coconut with your head, with which mouth are you going to suck the succulent fruit? It's always my question to them. So we, we should take it easy, not uh, thinking of making it out of thin air. Uh, element of uh, hard work has to be there. The biggest impact uh, in African community from my side is my noticeable and tangible contribution during the rebranding, revamping and the restoration of a Nigerian image program organized by our embassy. I was there visibly. I contributed so much. Then I do go out also to give some orientation, talk, uh, advise our people on how to live and what to do in some situations. Yeah, they are not doing anything more more than us other than that they are less corrupt and they are more organized and they believe in hard working and um, some elements of love for the country for the land has to come in also for instance the ministers the politicians in nigeria or maybe in some parts of africa will always take out their money they have found and they invest in foreign land in malaysia in this case do not do the same. What they do is they use the same money and invest in this in this their land thereby creating job opportunities for their own citizens. So it's basically about taking the money and investing in the country instead of taking the money out as uh, is the case with the African leaders. I could remember a time that uh, Mahati visited either Nigeria or one of the African countries. He was advising our leaders not to take out their money, rather invest that money in your own country because this will uh, create some economic uh, buoyance. I mean, you'll be buoyant economically. We create job vacancies for the citizens and that will boom the help in the booming of the economy. <laughs>